cities and other American cities and cities in the, the Americas. And at that point, I held up a chart, which my lovely sister assisted me has. You have to hold it up a little higher. And I held up a chart of 20 or so of the great cities in Africa. And the challenge for me was to state that there's a tale of two cities, the cities and towns of America in which we have black players, and there's a tale of the great cities of Africa, in which this is the chart that I showed them. And it includes cities like Abidjan, Accra, Addis Ababa, Lagos, Kampala, Cairo. And my challenge to them was that we need to link up with these African great cities and the important towns that are attached to them. And because the leadership in the National Conference of Mayors was receptive to this, they have followed this process through, and certainly with the current leader, Mayor Bowser, it's an important passion of his. His family has been linking to Africa for many decades. And so, I'm going to leave this with the governor of Ocean State as a memento of the connections that we are making. Thank you very much. As we see the potential for African development, we also have to realize the challenges that Africans face. So these are the best of times because of the potential that we have in our hands to build together. But these are the worst of times because of the crises that we see everywhere. You look at North Africa and you don't know from which day to the next there'll be another crisis. I pray that the Creator does not bring the, the, the movement and the chaos that we see in North Africa to West Africa, to Central Africa, to South Africa to East Africa, because we have a lot of work to do, and the chaos that we now see in North Africa would not move our plans and our agenda along the way it should be. These are historic times, and we are making history, and so since I'm celebrating my 50th anniversary of joining you in Africa, I'd like to read a short little statement in reference to my relationship to the continent. I said I'm celebrating my 50th anniversary of coming back and forth to Africa. That is worthy of the knowledge. My wife, you know, women always lead the way. And my wife led the way to Africa before I knew her, before I married her. She was in Nigeria 51 years ago in the summer of 1960, in a little village near Nsuka called Ehabufu, working with Nigerian youth and laying out the parameters for it. Let's give my wife an announcement. If we don't take care of these wives, we can't go home. And Mayor Bowser has been raised up, he's our leader, he's made strong statements, but we don't realize that Mayor Bowser has alongside of him for many, many years a wonderful African woman, African-American woman of talent and beauty and strength. So let's give Mayor Bowser's partner an acknowledgement. <laughs> and these are models and examples that we need to maintain. I want to hold up before you, and unfortunately we don't have it for the screen, but an image of what we have to be about. This is an image of an African woman, one of the most important African women in our history. And not enough is known about her because we don't tell our story. Mm -hmm. The history that we have is his story, the story of rich white men with property and power. But this image is so important for us to maintain, and that's why I mentioned the lies. This is the wife of one of the greatest Africans 
in our history. The Pharaoh of Egypt during the 18th dynasty, Amenophis III, who expanded the great city of Thebes, Luxor, who built the great pillar temple, the greatest institution of the ancient world. She was by his side for 38 years ruling Egypt. And when he died, she was the queen mother regent for 16 years, saving the throne for her great son, the pharaoh Agnaton, who built a new city of God because of the belief in the oneness of God. You know Agnaton's wife, Nefertiti, but you don't know Agnaton. You know her grandson, King Tut, but you do not know her. And clearly this image of a powerful black woman is one that cannot be put in the history books, but we have to put it there. Why? Because whoever controls the images, controls the self-esteem, what you think about yourself, controls the self-respect, how you respect yourself and others that look like you particularly. And the images control self-development. Many of our people are caught up in what I call arrested development because someone else has controlled our images. We don't accept our beauty as Africans. We want to change and transform and process ourselves into Europeans. We don't accept our beauty as Africans who may be of the Islamic faith. We want to change and transform ourselves into an Arab cultural formation. So we as Africans, if we're going to go forth with strength and power, have to accept our beauty as the first people on the planet, the original people on the planet, the people who brought forth life and culture and civilization, science and mathematics and medicine. We have to take control of our history. And two of my mentors and inspirators I need to acknowledge at this moment. One is from the continent of Africa. Background, a Muslim background from Senegal, but he became a master scientist, physicist, linguist, Egyptologist, and that's Dr. Shekhan Tadiyah. He stands at the head of our great scholars who have been reversing the history and giving us back the truth of who and what we are. And from the United States, a partner of Shekhan Tadiyah, and his great work is civilization and barbarism. Unfortunately, I had an opportunity to raise money from various foundations to get this great work published in French, translated in English. Civilization of Barbarism establishes who we are as African people. It establishes us as the first people, so there's an African origin of humanity. It establishes us, us as a people evolved into large grain humanity, so there's an evolution of society that's African. It establishes clearly the scientific and historical data that the foundation culture of the river valleys of the world, such as the Nile, the Niger, and the Tigris Euphrates, come from the mind and the spirit of African peoples. One of our great works, check out today. <laughs> Don't be afraid to acknowledge your great works. Let's give him an analysis and a small to their fullness, and we have to acknowledge this great work. And then a partner of his from America was my teacher. Self-taught from Alabama, raised in Georgia, linked up with the greats of the continent, such as Ali Mundia, linked up with the greats of Nigeria, such as Jacob Ajayi and uh, Dr. D.K., and a whole host of others. This is Dr. John Henry Clark. I would, not, I would be remiss by not raising his voice and his image and knowledge of him to you at this moment. Dr. John Henry Clark. Now, with that introduction, let me quickly get into my presentation. Hold your breath. I'm going to move as fast as I can. Tradition and innovation in subnational politics in Ivory Coast. The preface to that document reads. On January 15, 1962, President Ufer Pony addressed the National Assembly of the Ivory Coast Republic and delivered one of the most important political statements of his long public career. Five months earlier, the new nation had celebrated the first anniversary of its 
Independence, and I was there at that moment in 1961. During 1960, 1961, the superstructure of the nation state had been firmly established. The time had arrived to set a political course and mobilize the people for the task of national development. In his historic address, the president emphasized the need for unity, particularly in a country with 60 different ethnic groups. The most significant part of the address, however, concerned economic development, especially in agriculture, in order to build a sound economy. He called for a general mobilization of the country's peoples and resources. To realize this development, he outlined three major steps that would be instituted by the government. All three are key aspects of his program of, quote, state capitalism, investment by the state in the people. First, there would be a recognizing of the a reorganizing of the financial structure in order to create two national budgets, one for general governmental expenditures and the other for special developmental projects. Second, a network of state corporations would be created called Societe d'État, state societies, which would be established to develop the national wealth in, and particularly in the rural areas. Finally, an intermediate development plan for 1962 and 63 would be instituted as part of a revised 10-year plan, which would include regional sub-plans as, as an important component. He stated that these plans would have significant implications for the sub-national political development and would help lessen the growing regional disparities and social inequalities. This was a statement that the President of Africa made and I became very close to Ivory Coast development. My PhD was done on subnational politics in the Ivory Coast. How you can organize your state systems to be able to deliver to the bulk of our people. For the most part, development has been targeted into the great cities, just as I showed you. But our great task is to take that development that's usually targeted to the great cities and target it to the rural areas targeted where the bulk of our populations are. Recently, I was in Senegal with some of the mayors from America, and the president of Juan of Senegal is working closely and linking our peoples up around the world. He has a very strong pan-African legacy that he has inherited from people like Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, the president of Ghana, and Dr. Nandi Azikwe, who have been the leader of Nigeria. And he's carrying that legacy of Pan-Africanism uh, in his heart and trying to work out how do we implement it. In the state of Bible for one, he says you have to have plans. You have to have institutions. You have to have reorganization in order to be able to achieve what you uh, need to achieve. And I want to congratulate those of you in Ocean State and Ondo State for the changes and plans that you put in place. I have to admit that I was a little disappointed in making the ride from Lagos to Ibadan, a ride which I've made many times over the last 50 years. And I did not see a super highway leading through the country. I was disappointed. I did not see the, the work and development on both sides of the road that I wanted to see. But fortunately, coming here with you and listening to your genius presentations and your understanding of the problems, and then meeting you on the ground, seeing the projects and the activities that you are doing, I'm very proud that Nigeria has leadership that's ready to move Nigeria into the 21st century as a leader of African peoples. <laughs> we from America, who have the benefit of having the wealth of the United States in our hands have to figure out with you how we can use those resources to help the development of Africa. And yesterday when we saw the agricultural developments, the, the developments for the children, the, the hospital developments, uh, it is clear that there are leaders in Nigeria that have a plan that we can be a part of and make a contribution to the poor development of Our leaders also, as we look at what you're doing, and we notice the potential for development mutually, 
will be coming up with plans that you may be able to help us with in the United States. And so there will be a mutual development uh, between our peoples. Most of you may not realize that a great city in America such as Houston, Texas, which has a heavy oil industry, is one of the dynamic cities in America, several million people. Houston has a population from Nigeria of 40 to 50,000 people. And so as we link up with your sons and daughters that are in America, and we pull together the resources that we can garner, and the plans and ideas that we can work together on, there is an enormous potential for Africans achieving what we thought independence was going to achieve, for Africans putting in place what we thought in Puma and, and uh, Azikawe and uh, uh, Joe Pinata 